morning, everybody, and welcome to another Military History q and I'm well fueled on coffee and cheese, so I can get back to some of your questions. And I just got to tell you, your questions does not get answered necessarily in the order I get them. And yes, I'm backlogged, I know. Um, when I see several questions over the period that sort of belongs together, I'm going to drag them all in together. Like today, we're going to talk about several of your questions pertaining to kamikazes. Uh, one of the questions were, were kamikazes uh, only Japanese or did other militaries employ uh, kamikazes? The answer is no. Another question uh, on along that line was, what happened if kamikazes failed their missions? Apparently they become bishops, but we'll get back to more of that. And that leads me into a tangent about uh, German specialty weapons and directed, uh, direct guided missiles and other types of kamikazes and I have to round up a convocation that is so cheerful and happy uh, as kamikaze topic is about the psychology about how and why you get people to do those things and why some people are still doing that today. So it's a little bit, uh, unfortunately, this is a rather relevant topic. And I want to tell you a story about a really cool Australian sailor that more of you need to know the name of because true hero, uh, young kid. And of course, I'll see if I can dig up a, a picture of the week for you as well. Next week or the week after, I will be going, like I told you, Poland, Germany still looking at some of your suggestions. I'm not sure I can make it to Norway. I'm going to try. Um, there's all all these restrictions and sneaking in and out and I want to uh, try to set all the meetings at all the different locations I'm going to and some of you urban explorers out there, you, you know exactly who I'm talking to, uh, we should talk more. Um, we should go do some things. And a thank you to YouTube. Unfortunately now you will all be inflicted with commercials uh, doing some of these Q&A's, but I'm spending a lot of time doing this for you guys and uh, No one's paying me and I'm sorry again for not shaving. It's very unseemly I know but for the whole Hollywood mission of my life I have a photo shoot coming up next week, so you just gonna have to live with it. Anyway, here we go So to answer the question about kamikaze When I say kamikaze you all think suicide pilot plane you think Japanese and now we're going to see how horrible my Japanese pronunciation of things really are. But the question was, and I'm going to start with the easy answers and work my way backwards. Were there any other uh, fighting units utilizing the concept of kamikaze being that of using your plane, your tank, your ship in a suicidal way against the enemy in such a way that you're not really presuming to come back alive? Um, give up your life for the fatherland or motherland to uh, kill your enemy. Well, let's go with that definition of kamikaze because some of, some of them are a little lighter, uh, such as the translations of being daredevil and so on and so forth. Not important. Um, the British Air Force uh, certainly at several occasions used their planes to ram German planes. Uh, Heinkel uh, 111 was crashed into by a reservist pilot who brought it down during the Battle of Britain and the British pilots also uh, used their planes sometimes to ram or tip the V1 uh, flying bombs as they came over. Uh, there was a Hawker Hurricane that used uh, his wingtips to poke holes in Adornia, a uh, German bomber, to uh, bring that down. But that was not really an official sanctioned policy. It was not a, a official doctrine for British pilots to ram German planes and so forth. You can also say that during the invasion of Poland, and this is of no surprise to me at all, and God bless the Polish, if you look at some of the exploits of the free Polish fighting the Germans after the invasion of Poland, uh, such of the, uh, I think the Polish destroyer, the submarine planes, um, just charging headlong against German battleships. Absolutely no surprise whatsoever that there were Polish pilots uh, 
that used their planes to ram uh, German planes during the invasion of Poland in 1939. And one of the first one, Leopold Pamula, Polish pilot, intentionally ran his uh, PCL P-11C into a German aircraft at the very opening of World War II. And there are several more stories of how Polish pilots, uh, after having expended their ammunition, uh, rammed their planes into uh, German bombers on the way to cities and, and so on. And again, it was not really a sanctioned or doctrine that they should go out and, and do that. Uh, however, when you go a little further east, Russian pilots were known to have done this. There's at least nine different Soviet pilots that rammed uh, German bombers with their old obsolete aircraft. Also, at the invasion of Barbarossa, a lot of Russian aircraft were obsolete to the point where that's kind of all they had. And if you look at some of the training and indoctrination amongst uh, Russian pilots, some of them were literally scared to go back to their airfields uh, without having expended their bombs or ammunitions because of the commissars were waiting. So uh, the thought of ramming their plane into a German bomber and me not coming back, or coming back to be shot for not having brought it down a German plane, I may be exaggerating a little bit, might not have been shot, but certainly there was a fear amongst the Russian soldiers for their commissars uh, after the purges of the Soviet Union. And there was a term called Tehran by uh, the Russian pilots where they would and with some encouragement, ram their planes into uh, German planes. So that was a little closer to a government-sanctioned policy, or at least accepted policy, of kamikaze uh, amongst the Russians. Now we have to go to the Germans before we get to the Japanese, because the Germans had units that actually were set up deliberately to, to ram Allied bomber planes at the end of the war. 1944, Hajo uh, Hermann, which was a confidant of Hermann Goering, and he was also the inventor of the Wilde Sau uh, technique of how the Luftwaffe should engage British night bombers uh, by firing off flares and uh, attacking uh, in, in fast surprise attacks. He came up with a brilliant idea uh, that the Luftwaffe could use older near obsolete uh, Messerschmitt 109 planes, having their weapons being uh, dismounted, machine guns, no bombs, just enough fuel to get there and not really get back again, to ram Allied bomber planes. At this point in time, the Allied bomber force were pretty much leveling Germany day and night, and there was not enough of a defense uh, able to be put up. There's not enough anti-aircraft weapons, there was not enough fighter planes, there was not enough skilled pilots, which was becoming one of the main issues besides the fuel for the German Luftwaffe. So slightly less trained but very highly enthusiastic volunteers and young pilots especially were recruited for Sonderkommando Elbe. Stop! When I say Sonderkommando, I'm sick of always seeing this. If you write Sonderkommando, all you get is references to how that pertains to the Holocaust, which it has nothing to do with. Sonderkommando means special command, special military command, a special detachment of military for a specific mission. In this case, it was a special command of pilots trained to ram their aircraft into other aircraft has nothing to do specifically with the Holocaust. It is a generic German military term. Thank you. Just wanted to clear that up because we still have, I don't know how that word just got hijacked. Uh, every military unit has some commandos to this day. And we have special commands, we have special operations forces, all the different things. Anyway, moving on. On April 7th, 1945, the first large scale attack of uh, Sonderkommando Elbe was uh, taken into effect, and there really only was one. 120 fighter planes have been uh, refitted or strengthened to ram the Allied planes. The idea, the concept was that the faster ME-262s were going to engage the Allied fighters, while the 
ram planes were going to crash into the actual bombers. In this case, it was B-17s. You have a bomber force of 1,300 bombers, and about 13 of them were brought down in this way. Most of those pilots did not survive. However, uh, quite a few actually did to live and talk about it, and you may have seen some of the interviews that I cannot show you because I don't hold the rights to them. So what happened was the, the concept was not really kamikaze in that sense. It was a little more optimistic in the sense that they were to use the propellers to try to churn up the uh, wing surfaces, the rudders, the tails, so the bombers could no longer uh, fly or steer. Uh, only in the very last resort was it suggested they would actually ram pilot first, nose first, into the body of an Allied bomber plane. There, at least for the pilots, were some hope of surviving. Not a whole lot of hope, because you still at a significant speed going to ram your plane into another plane or get close enough to grind up their wings or their fuselage presumably while all their gunners are shooting madly at you and there was a lot of shooting that day including some of the allies were shooting at their own planes because there was a lot of confusion uh, as, as this happened 13 allied bombers were brought down and they did not really enjoy a whole lot of success and they did not do it again. Again, 17 April 1945, the war was coming to an end and everybody was out of everything and it did seem rather futile to deliberately give your life uh, when the end was within sight as it was. And also, after you have rammed your plane or at least disabled their plane and your plane, you had to crawl out of the cockpit and make it out in a parachute. There was no ejector seats in any of these planes. So it, it was and must have been a harrowing experience for the pilots to deliberately ram their plane into an Allied plane, hoping that they might actually be able to escape afterwards. But hope, as I will talk about at, at the end of this, held a lot of promise, especially if you're a young soldier. The whole concept of I might make it hope will make you do incredibly stupid things that if you're over 40, I don't really see that hope anymore. You just see all the downsides to doing this thing. So they were going for a younger, uh, slightly probably more politically active or indoctrinated pilots, but they were all volunteers, as were most of the kamikazes we'll see were all volunteers. Oddly enough, there's never, nor unfortunately as there is today, when you see what's coming out of uh, the Middle East, no shortage of suicide bombers, suicide pilots back then. I interesting what goes through people's minds if they are deliberately tasked with killing themselves and to destroy their enemy. Of course, this whole concept was born out of desperation because Germany no longer had the ability to keep their skies uh, defended from Allied invasions. Hitler supposedly was not keen on this whole possible suicide idea, uh, although of course the Japanese had been doing this deliberately uh, for uh, some years now. He tacitly supposedly had accepted the idea but only after giving the command himself personally. Whether he did this or not is not clear. I could not find any reference except April 7th he was pretty busy with other things, so may or may not have been busy directing our operations. The other interesting component the Germans built was the Leonardis uh, squadron. Uh, Leonardis being inspired by the Spartan king uh, that led the Spartan 300 that stood and died and fought at uh, Thermopylae. And it was supposed a concept idea of uh, Hermann and Skorsene to have dedicated pilots. They were organized into Staffel 5 uh, in uh, Kampfgeswader 200, where some 700 volunteers had signed up, uh, started training in 1944. The idea was not as much to uh, use their planes as a ram, but they were experimenting with different aircrafts 
that could be the parasite aircraft with a smaller on top of a drone aircraft laden with bombs that would then be detached as they neared the target area and guided onto the area um, by, the, by the pilot of the smaller plane that had detached itself. Different weaponry was developed and used by the Germany for that. The whole drone aircraft, wire-guided aircraft, wire-guided bombs, uh, wire guided missiles, camera guided missiles that was uh, on radio frequency. A uh, battleship had been, uh, been destroyed by uh, a camera guided bomb, as I covered in a previous episode. And this was very interesting because different uh, airplanes were chosen to piggyback on, on top of either existing aircraft frames like the Heinkels that were to be filled up with weaponry and bombs and explosive and got into an area or they were developing specific large flying bombs that would be uh, camera guided into the target at the end of the war they had not quite gotten there yet but uh, some 10 days after Sonderkommando Elba somewhat failed in their attack on the US Air Force at this point in time, some 35 of the reigning volunteers attacked the British over the Elbe upon which the Russian infantry was pouring towards Berlin. And there were some different information as to how many they destroyed. They themselves claimed to have destroyed 17 bridges over the Elbe using the drone aircraft or in some cases piloting their own aircraft uh, towards a trajectory or path towards this bridge and then jumping out uh, in time. Anthony Bivore wrote that they had only verified one bridge destroyed in, in this way. Uh, several historians I know have found holes near bridges large enough to be impact craters of these planes and these flying bombs. Uh, I will look into this further, but exactly how much of a success they had is a little questionable and certainly Germany being surrounded, being pounded from all sides, 35 pilots with a suicidal tendencies to fly their aircraft into uh, bridges or uh, planes or Russian fortifications did not really do much of a difference at this point. But the technology was experimented with and that went a long way, as we know, in the uh, post-World War II world. And they had some really interesting planes they developed and tested and fell into Allied hands after the war. We all know, for one, that the V-1 flying bomb was outfitted with a cockpit and it was test flown by pilot Hannah Reich, as we talked about when we went to the Minnesota uh, Museum. And um, the Japanese also adopted this uh, concept and used it more, far more. The Germans never really used this in a kamikaze way and it is questionable if that was the idea or the intent was uh, to outfit a V1 with a cockpit and weaponry to be fast and do strafing attacks on Allied planes, or it was supposed to be used to guide it into planes. There would have been volunteers for it, certainly, but the mindset of Western soldiers were not really that of suicide attacks. There's a lot of different components that goes into how you can have a mindset accepting suicide attacks, suicide pilots, uh, deliberately having uh, entire units of uh, men who are ready uh, to go and willing and wanting and volunteering to go uh, kill themselves uh, splashed all over the enemy battleship. We can talk a little bit about that but that was not, it was an alien mindset certainly to Germany, Britain, to America it is interesting that one of the first heroes supposedly of the U.S. air war was a B-17 pilot that supposedly crashed his um, B-17 after the crew had jumped out into the funnel of a Japanese destroyer. That turned out later on that that was actually not true. 
but and at that time the whole kamikaze theory had been brought into practice by the Japanese and was not really seen as a positive at that point. But with the right motivation, the, the concept of risking your life or almost deliberately sacrificing it is not entirely alien. If you look at what happened during 9-11, uh, where you had two F-16s that was tasked with bringing down Flight United, uh, United Flight 93, none of them were armed. Uh, no weaponry on board. And it has uh, been stated by the pilots later on that if they had been tasked with bringing down that plane before it made it onto or over uh, densely populated areas, well, the only way to do that would have been to ram their own jet into it, which they seem to be willing to do uh, for to save lives. So the concept of kamikaze with the proper motivation will and could befall anybody. Uh, the German pilots, they had a program, uh, but it was not even if we all knew that by ramming your plane into another plane is probably suicide, the German pilots, at least again, well, you can just jump, you can theoretically exit your aircraft seconds before, or in the case of one pilot, after. After it tumbled over the B-17, he actually made it out. Um, so the Germans did employ this concept, and other militaries did individually use it, uh, and some great, great, amazing heroics have been committed by a lot of soldiers. But we get back to the Japanese. Uh, they, their version of the V1, they called the Oka, the cherry blossom, which was essentially the same, and it was designed based on plans they had gotten from, uh, from the Germans. They did use these some 70 times, uh, which was essentially a rocket-guided bomb with a pilot, and they did sink uh, one. Uh, they did sink one U.S. destroyer, and some half dozen small warships were damaged. But that was not the mainstay of the Kamikaze force. They were more complicated to build. There were not that many of them, as most of the Kamikazes employed older Japanese aircrafts that were either at the end of their service life or were just outright outdated and were well suited for that last flight loaded with bombs and fuel for one way, as we'll see now. Somewhere between three and 4,000 kamikaze operations were conducted. The numbers are conflicting, I'm sorry. And about 360 Allied ships were uh, damaged, uh, some were destroyed and sunk by these kamikaze uh, attacks. You have the USS Bunker Hill, the Intrepid, and of course the old USS and Enterprise that were all badly damaged aircraft carriers uh, hit by uh, kamikaze attacks. However, most of them were recovered and rebuilt and repaired. This is one thing you have to say for the US Navy of World War II. They had excellent damage control and they were able to save uh, carriers and ships that had it been they had to be in other navies, probably would not have survived as they did. The first time the Japanese used kamikaze attacks was October 25th on 1944 in the Battle of Lehi Gulf. Now, the Battle at Lehi Gulf had begun to swing quite against the Japanese, and at one point where it became rather clear that they were not winning this battle, Japanese naval captain Motoharu Ukamura stated clearly that if we attack with our planes, ramming them into their ships, we have not volunteers for this, we could turn the tide of the battle for our country. Yeah, that didn't work out that well. Now again, the numbers are a little bit conflicting because uh, despite the success uh, the um, Japanese kamikaze had, we're looking at, at Lehi Gulf, it was said, that there were some 5,000 kamikaze pilots died. Granted, some of the planes that were used were uh, multi-engine planes with more than one pilot. It was also said throughout the war only 3,800 kamikaze pilots uh, died uh, total from other sources. 
Averagely, it comes out to about 19-20% success rate for kamikaze attacks, which wasn't really that bad uh, compared to how hard uh, U.S. battleships were to hit with aerial bombs or torpedoes. That's possible because throughout the entire war, the Japanese Air Force built 79,123 planes. 80,000 planes built during World War II by Japan is really not bad, and I was rather surprised. For comparison, Germany built 120,000 planes and the U.S. Uh, 3,003. I think Italy built about seven or 8,000 planes throughout the war. So the Japanese were building, and we always had the impression that they were technically backwards and their weapons were outdated, but they were building rocket fighters, they were working on nuclear weapons, and they were building 80,000 aircraft. So they had older planes to spare, and for the kamikaze, less than, well, less than the best pilots could be used because, well, they didn't really have to learn how to land, although most of them were volunteers that uh, were ostentatiously, according to themselves, quite happy to do so. The first 24 volunteer pilots were from the Japanese 201st Navy Air Group, and they were targeting the U.S. escort carriers, one of them with the St. Lowe, which was struck by a Zero and sunk in less than an hour, killing 100 American sailors. An interesting note is from 1944 when the Japanese began uh, selecting and training kamikaze aircraft pilots. A lot of them were trained on gliders, uh, they were trained on very rudimentary uh, tactics, aircraft training platforms, and you might have seen the picture of them sitting in literally what looks like a milk box with a stick and a, and a set of crosshairs. Because Japan was low on fuel and you could not really afford a lot of the training flights in order to have really well-trained pilots and those that were already well-trained qualified pilots they were already flying and fighting. Interesting enough the firstborn son were excluded from kamikaze service as it is with most cultures uh, at the time and probably today the firstborn son always held some uh, some importance of being the one to take over the family business or take care of the family or, and they were excluded for such service at least initially and very interestingly one of the questions were what happened to kamikaze pilots who failed or did not get to die gloriously for their country you have a uh, Sanaki Nakamura which uh, talks about how he was selected for kamikaze training but being the firstborn was allowed to go about his life until he was finally called up but by the time he got there uh, his uh, the, the war had ended unfortunately by the time he got back home his whole community and town had been bombed interestingly enough you asked what happened to uh, former kamikaze pilots this one he became an archbishop which is not exactly what you thought you would hear about kamikaze pilots you will find that most of these despite volunteering for a suicide mission, knowing it was a suicide mission, were the most normal, everyday, young guys, kids, that wanted to serve their emperor and their country and protect their fatherland. Which was really interesting because you're seeing these guys playing with puppies the day before they go off to kill themselves by crashing their plane into uh, an ally warship. But every time I say kamikaze, you obviously think it's only aircraft, but no. The Japanese also developed a uh, Kaiten, a kamikaze submarine, or uh, as it really was initially, a manned torpedo. And in 1944, as the war was turning against Japan, even though most of the officers would not admit it, the proposal were made to the naval command for a special attack unit of manned submarines based on the Type 93 torpedo. Initially that was turned down, but some research started to show that there was potential, and the Kaitan construction began in February 1944 with a, a first hundred ordered. Uh, the f prototype was developed and delivered on July 25, uh, 1944. 
the submarine torpedo was actually rather successful. It only ranked second to the flying kamikaze plane in efficiency. So it was effective and it did its job. So just one week after the first prototype was created, the Imperial Japanese Navy ordered a hundred more. Now, the early Kaitans really were a little bit simple. Like I said, they were pretty much just built on the Type 93. Several types were designed, some were built, some were practiced, some were still on the drawing board when the war actually ended. Um, they, the first one was very rudimentary and limited in its steering capacity, uh, sometimes having to surface in order to uh, orient itself towards the enemy battleship. Uh, however, it did require uh, rigorous training and the underwater pilots were trained very uh, very seriously very serious training and it was dangerous training they were uh, trained to uh, sail in circles to navigate uh, deep underwater obstacles they had to be aware of their oxygen and the environment they had to be able to navigate and a lot of them actually didn't survive their training one of them was because uh, part of the training was steering their torpedo into the side of a mock-up battleship or a mock-up ship with a mock-up warhead and if you are mounting a metal torpedo and you run it into anything causing a sudden halt as it slams into the side of anything at 30 knots you are really not going to have a good day and oddly enough, some of them died from this, so training had to be modified. Of course, the Kai-10 was bigger than a regular torpedo, and it had to have a housing for the pilot, so they had to be either launched from land, from ships, or from the deck of a submarine that then had to surface. It would have to be charged, uh, air, the uh, oxygen, everything it needed, and the pilot had to climb in, and then it would have to be detached pointed uh, in the general direction it was going and during this entire time the submarine was on the surface uh, very vulnerable to any kind of attack or sh shell fire or uh, airplane attack from whatever it was about to attack. One would think that night attacks would uh, have been more optimal except for the impossibility of the pilot of the Kai-10 be to be able to see a darkened out enemy battleship uh, when submerged or either low to the water. So we, I could see some problems with that. <clears throat> the Type 1, which was the closest to the Type 93 torpedo, did 30 knots uh, but had to surface to adjust course. About 300 of those were made. You had the Type 2, which was much closer to an actual mini submarine. It would do a 40 knots. However, it has some problems. It was fueled by a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and hydrazine hydrate and mixture of potassium. And if you know, all those things are really bad for your health to begin with. And then you add production issues, quality control, and you lock up a human being in uh, the close proximity of all these things that if leaking in any which way, guaranteed to kill you right off. Uh, hydrogen peroxide sitting right behind the pilot, and that would eat its way through things, including sometimes probably the pilot. It also did, <laughs> um, yeah, not 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 really a very uh, very healthy mixture. And they really quickly figured out this was just not a good idea to put all these deadly chemicals inside a tube with a guy that's supposed to stay alive long enough to steer it into the side of the ship. So they came up with the Type 4, which is pretty much the same as the Type 2, but it had a propellant way much similar to the Type 93, although it also did have its problems with leaking fuel and it was not quite as fast as the Type 2. But it might actually get there without killing the pilot. Finally, you had the Type 10, which was smaller than uh, all the others by a third, used an electric motor and could paddle away at a pithy seven knots. It also had a warhead that was a lot smaller and not a lot were built and it barely made it into production by the end of the war. So there you have it. 
remember all navies made miniature submarines the Japanese just made them run into ships although labeled as very efficient the US Navy estimates that three uh, Navy ships were sunk by the Kaitan torpedoes however there's also a number of unidentified sinkings of Allied shipping where it's quite possible that the Kaiten could have played a part if no enemy planes or ships had been nearby they could have been sunk by such also some of the Kaitens were seen to self-destruct and yes they had a self-destruct button because sometimes if they broke down or they got caught up in netting or whatever there would be a self-destruct possibility for instance one would think that if the hydrogen peroxide had eaten through the tanks and were slowly melting the pilot alive uh, maybe a, an instant death of self-destruction would be to be preferred just saying um, yeah on July 24 45 the USS Earl Johnson and the USS Underhill were attacked by Kaitan torpedoes and the Underhill as a destroyer was uh, sunk uh, by such they did try to fight off the launching submarine as stated in their logs which again uh, denotes that the submarine that was delivering this Kaitan was on the surface for enough time for it to be seen and fired upon by the underhill but it didn't make it the Kaitan uh, sunk the ship still now it must be said that the kamikaze pilots often not often but kamikaze pilots survived to some degree if they had if they couldn't find the enemy if there were no enemy they could return and land if they had uh, technical difficulties and they had to crash land or return to base it was acceptable answering the question for kamikazes to not fulfill a kamikaze mission if they had a good reason not to do so for instance, if no enemy was found or their, or their plane uh, had a problem. However, if you got strapped into a Kai-10, you were not coming out. And I have found absolutely no documentation, no surviving accounts of any of the underwater pilots surviving a Kai-10, which may explain the um, self-destruct button. Also, some of the pilots uh, were literally screwed into a locked inside the cockpit. So when they got in there, they knew they were not coming out. Whereas one would think that some of the kamikaze pilots that took off might have that thought that maybe they couldn't fulfill a mission and maybe they'd have to get back. Maybe they'd be ridiculed by their friends and their co-pilots and others, their families, for not fulfilling a kamikaze mission. But they'd be alive and one would think life, the concept of surviving to be ridiculed may hold a little bit more promise. Uh, but for the Navy pilots, there was really no such thing. And there's no evidence of this having distracted them for their mission and for their duties leading up to it. They had rituals before they took off. The Navy pilots had rituals before they set sails or set propellers in their little torpedoes. Kamikaze is a very interesting concept of human self-destructiveness in spite of an individual internal hope for survival, which I will explain. One of the Kamikaze pilots who survived the war was a Taikino Ena. He was part of a crew of three that flew a bomber plane, so here you have more than one in a plane. And again, because a lot of the kamikaze designated planes or aircraft were coming to the end of the service life, technical problems was very possible. And he was lucky three times for the Battle of Okinawa. For this first mission, they, didn't, they weren't able to get airborne. On the second mission, he got airborne, but the engine trouble forced them to do an emergency landing. And the third mission, again, engine trouble made him ditch in the sea and he survived the war. However, he survived the war with a great deal of guilt that unlike so many of his comrades who had gone off and given their life, he had not. And there's a certain amount of peer pressure and family pressure and honor 
that was inculcated in the Japanese soldiers, which brings us back to the Code of Bushido of the Empress uh, influence on the military, on the whole military code of honor, and the very harsh indoctrination and training by the military of well, everybody. And once they were set down a career path in the Japanese military, well, it'd been literally or physically beaten into you from day one that this is where you were going. And a sense of, uh, for instance, uh, the Japanese planes didn't really have radios, they couldn't communicate, so they couldn't get new orders as to what to do if their missions were failing or they find no enemy. But also, for that reason, several kamikaze flights flew in pairs of squadrons for the peer pressure of, well, let's not give anybody the uh, thought that they might survive and be able to come back. Uh, and several pilots came back so many times, uh, one failed nine times and was eventually executed for cowardice. There's one interesting account that I want to read to you because apparently several hundred kamikaze pilots survived the war uh, when it ended. And some of them had guilt issues, but in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the more public conversation about this began. And even at the time, there were several people within the Japanese military that absolutely did not agree with this tactic at all stating that Japanese pilots' job was to shoot down other aircraft, not to sacrifice themselves. Kurahara says, and this is an interesting account of his from after the war, I struggled to convince myself I had to die. I thought my death would be pointless. Even if Japan won the war, my family would die in the gutter because I would not be there to support them. It tormented me. I felt I was losing my mind. Now, he's reflecting back to a time where he was literally sitting in a plane, in a kamikaze plane, uh, going off, expecting not to come back. We were told that rather than to accept defeat, we should offer our lives. There was no choice. We had to follow orders when push came to shove, but we didn't wish for death. His engine failed, and he had to crash land, lucky him, otherwise he wouldn't be here uh, to, to write about his life. He does state that after surviving he was still more relieved uh, from surviving than he was afraid of having dishonored his family or being ridiculed or maybe beaten up by his other pilots, friends. And on the following day, uh, good luck to him, his unit was disbanded because the war was coming to an end. But still, to this day, he lays down flowers on the uh, shrine to other fallen kamikazes because there will always be some guilt and you see that in a lot of combat soldiers who return while their friends did not, whether this is regular combat operations, there's a survivor's guilt that is not uncommon for frontline combat soldiers. There's also an interesting part of the whole concept of the kamikaze pilot was somewhat of a Japanese icon that was elevated in Japanese society. The emperor which hold or held a sway over Japanese society as some seen as a living god, he would visit the shrine to the kamikazes who had fallen given their life twice a year, honoring them. You also had to see the religious influence in society at the time and the indoctrination by the military and by the same religious indoctrination and from the Code of Bushido, which was a warrior code much held as medieval chivalry. It is a code for warriors to uphold themselves to acting honorable on the battlefield and dying with honor, fighting with honor, and giving their life as the ultimate sacrifice for their country and for their fellow soldiers. Now, if you look at the Bushido, if you look at the samurai, Certainly there were a lot of Japanese officers that were descendant from the samurai. Many of the young kamikaze pilots were probably not among them. However, the mindset from the top 
these samurai were the officers of the Japanese army and in their mindset must have flowed down throughout the ranks and impressed on these young soldiers the same code of the warrior and instill that that spirit of sacrifice in them and you see that in some of the statements from the kamikaze that although they had a human desire to live it was not at all uh, questionable to die for their country and their families and their homeland and for the emperor who would then honor them because remember they all believed as kamikaze they would meet again in the afterlife at the shrine where the emperor would worship and and praise them so there's a lot of different cultural aspects to this as well not just the mere front fact that you are trying to fight off an enemy seeking to destroy your country and kill your family your friends and your soldier colleagues which is the most predominant reason why soldiers go off to fight and unquestionably die fighting for what they believe in for believe in the safety uh, that they're fighting for the safety of their nation the kamikazes were certainly doing the same thing you have to remember even today when you send a soldier off on a combat mission it is in the back of everybody's mind or the front that you may not come back if you go off to war you know you probably you could get hurt you could get killed but and if especially it is saw the same thing with the German units and the kamikaze units they recruited from the young uh, the younger highly motivated uh, the the 20 year olds the I think the Germans said from from 20 to 27 now if you're 19 20 21 as some of you are and I hate you deeply for it because I'm not you can't die I remember when I was 20 I couldn't die no matter what I did I would volunteer for the dumbest things no way can't die can't happen so if you volunteer for combat operations and you're in your 20s you see even if they send you on the most suicidal of missions you see the little 1% tunnel of light as the destination for that mission you will get through that pinhole even if there's only 1% chance of survival, if you're 20, that is all you see is that little speck of light down there. And you have very little doubt that you'll make it. Now, if you're 40, the little speck of light becomes a little further away because you see the 99% chance that you're not coming back from this mission. You may still go on the mission because you know there's a chance you might survive. But you also know there's a much bigger chance that you will not. Your youthful idealism and um, you, when you get a little older, you get a little smarter. And you do learn a few things about life and you attend enough funerals, you know that Death is something that's a very real thing, and in war it happens, and it can happen to you, and you have to weigh that much more consciously that if you're 20, uh, that's just the way life is. That's the difference between a young and, and, and the older. And that's why uh, you see if you're faced with child soldiers, if you see some around the world, they are a very scary uh, bunch of kids because they have no concept as such of life and death they have no fear of death but they also have no value of uh, the life of others if you live and you know how important individual lives are you are less likely to uh, take those lives if unavoidable but you are certainly also more protective of your own life and here we have to talk a little bit about the difference between the ideologies the culture, the religion, and the Western sensibilities of life. Because all those aspects back then had a vast influence on the way of life. You saw the Germans being very reluctant to go full out kamikaze, risking their lives. But they did because 
it was constructed in a sense that they might survive. You bail from your plane just before you hit the Allied plane. Whereas in Japanese, uh, pilots in Japan, because of the um, of the sense of the warrior of the Code of Bushido that must have gone throughout all aspects of the Japanese military, you saw the suicidal bonsai attacks on the ground from Japanese soldiers attacking into massed machine guns uh, being mowed down, knowing they would not come back. You see a willingness to sacrifice one's own life in Japan much more than you do in Western armies where lives do I'm not going to say matters more or is held in a different value, but I will say, that I'll say it this way, where death is less desirable or acceptable as it was in the culture of a warrior country of Japan, within a warrior uh, society as Japan was, led by the military, with an emperor that uh, demanded, or at least in his name, would sacrifice was demanded and expected, where suicide, if you had brought shame upon yourself or your family, suicide was an accepted way of uh, purging yourself. Life had a different meaning, and honor held a far higher position than life in, in some, uh, some sense which is why you could get the between three and five thousand uh, young Japanese pilots to take their own lives by ramming their planes or submarines into Allied ships, which would have been unthinkable if you gave that order in America or Britain or even Germany. Then you have a, the Russians that were so fearful of their commissars and had gone through the Russian Revolution where millions and millions of people have been murdered and killed and starved that the very sense of life in Russia had been devalued uh, which is one of the most horrible things that was done to Russia was the the communist revolution and the minds that that came with that and the commissars that would be able to stand behind the lines and force thousands of Russian soldiers literally running uh, towards German machine guns knowingly uh, to their death. They would literally charge the Germans in file, in ranks, just like World War I, until the Germans ran out of ammunition. Knowing that if you were the first couple of files, couple of ranks, you know you would not make it back. But they still did it, but they did it out of fear that if they didn't, they would be killed by the Commissar. And I suppose you, they would still hold out the hope that maybe they would just be wounded and maybe they would come back and maybe they would survive and maybe they would make it over the top. If you are in a kamikaze submarine, if you're in a kaiten, you're not coming back and you know that and they still did it. If you look at uh, the Middle East today and some, some uh, religious belief systems that encourage you taking your life by taking your enemy's life. You have these suicide bombers and it is frightening that to this day and age where so many of them are well educated uh, when it comes to books and history and knowledge still ready to go out and take their lives by destroying others even and civilians and children just for the mere sake of it. When it, If we stick to the, the warfare alone, I very much am in favor of what Patton said. It's not about dying for your country, it's making that other poor son of a bitch die for his. And that very much is what warfare should be about, and that is what soldiering is about. And you've also seen the evolution since acceptable loss during World War II, both for civilians and soldiers, was a lot different than acceptable loss for war today, where we are doing our pinpoint strikes, we have drones, uh, 
uh, flying combat missions because we will not risk lives. Life is valuable, and especially in the West, because if you go to certain parts of this world, life is still not as valuable as we in the West hold it. And that is tragic and sad, and I don't know if an education or it's a religious issue, but certainly certain cultures, certain religions, certain belief systems have far less of a problem encouraging their young people to sacrifice themselves for their country, for their belief, than we do. Stories from the war. Uh, Commander Aishi Tarari, at one point, he asked a group of 23 student pilots, all of whom he trained them, they all volunteered for the special attack force. He asked for volunteers, and they all raised their hands, volunteering to join these kamikaze operations. Later, uh, Tamari, he asked Lieutenant Yokuseki who com to command the Special Operations Task Force. Seki is said to have closed his eyes, lowering his head, and thought for se 10 seconds before saying, please do appoint me for the post. Seki became the 24th Kamikaze pilot to be chosen. He later said, well not much later, because for him there was no later. Japan's future is bleak if it is forced to kill one of its best pilots. And I'm not going on this mission for the Emperor or for the Empire. I'm going because I was ordered to. He flew his plane into an American battleship and died. And he was just a young kid. He, but he was ordered to and you follow orders, which is what military life is, if nothing else, the willingness to follow orders. Many of the young pilots for kamikaze missions, they usually flew southwest over Japan, Mount Kaimon. The mountain is also called Satsuma Fuji. It is said that the pilots would look over their shoulders to see the mountain as the southernmost of the Japanese mainland. And here they said their farewell to their country. It's also said that the residents that lived around this mountain often said that they saw some of the kamikaze pilots dropping flowers uh, from, the, from the air as they flew over. All the kamikaze pilots, as I said, they believed that once again in the afterlife they would all meet again at the Yashikuni Shrine where 2,466,000 divinities are enshrined here. This is where the Emperor would come and say thank you to them. One of the surviving kamikaze pilots recall his name was Kirichi Kuvahara. He flew out over the sea and he looked back on Japan and cried that he thought he would never again see his homeland. On May 4th 1945 he was heading for Okinawa and his mission to him was clear. He was to crash into an American warship killing himself and trying to take away the lives of hundreds of American troops that was trying to invade his homeland, as he wrote after. They didn't need to tell us what to do because we knew it was simple. We had to get in the plane and crash it into a target. I kept looking back thinking it was the last time I would see the land as I did. The sun came up and made the horizon shine light pink. I thought I have to go in order to defend this beautiful land. We are seeing Japanese pilots held the concept of kamikaze in high regard and many of them felt guilt for not uh, succeeding in their mission or having failed. Their families were also uh, helped and revered to some degree for having uh, given the ultimate sacrifice, not something unlike what we are seeing in suicide bombers in the Middle East today where their families are being given a stipend if one of their uh, children uh, kills themselves as a suicide bomber. Also in that war there were several other ways of gloriously killing yourself for your emperor or whoever else was in charge of your country. Uh, the Germans had experimented with uh, mortar torpedo boats heavily laden with explosives that they were to uh, 
race towards the invasion fleet and jump off just in time. Again, jumping off a speeding boat uh, at speed and surviving that in the waters of Normandy in the middle of an Allied invasion force may be called suicide as well. As well as the Japanese also had the option when Japan ran out of planes or torpedoes. They also experimented with the suicide explosive laden motor torpedo boats or motor boats, small boats. Uh, at the very uh, end of the war they were taught to dig holes uh, in the roads and sit there covered up clutching a large bomb or mine to detonate themselves with whatever allied vehicle would roll over them. So there's plenty of ways to kill yourself for your country and some of them believed that by doing so they would bring uh, victory closer. But if you look at countries or wars that has taken to suicide bombing, suicide missions, it is always the last stage before defeat. No country is going to win a war by killing their own or putting their own lives at risk. That is beyond uh, dictatorship. It is beyond internal dictatorship, whether it is a, a religious or a cultural or an act of desperation. When it, you ask for your soldiers or your civilians or children to go die, that you might prolong a war, you have already lost it. That is the sad fact of life. However, I want to tell one story of a, again, a kid. Hey, to me, they're all kids because you look at these 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds. One of them was an Australian sailor who at the very end gave his life. Spoiler alert. Australian seaman Eddie Sheen. He was 18 years old and he grew up in Australia and Tasmania. He was born in 1923. All his brothers had also signed up for the military and were already out fighting and he wanted to do his bit. He became an Olican gunner on the HMAS Armadale, a corvette, and was sailing fighting the Japanese. In 1942 his ship were attacked by Japanese bombers and Teddy was hit and it was sinking. The Japanese planes kept coming back and strafing the ship, although it was sinking, and strafing the seamen in the water. He himself was hit by uh, the aircraft fire and wounded. But seeing how the Japanese planes kept coming back and forth and strafing his friends in the water, he strapped himself into the Olican anti-aircraft gun and started firing from a ship that was sinking. And he kept firing, hit one of the planes that went down, and he kept firing, and he didn't stop firing until the ship had sunk with him strapped into the cannon. And the cannon was still firing when he was underwater, having his lifeless hand still depressing the firing mechanism. And his comrades commented on the cannons were still firing after he had gone under. He undoubtedly rescued or saved the lives of numerous of his friends. He went down knowing that he wasn't gonna leave this gun uh, ever and he's still strapped into it today. Now he was 18 years old and he knew what he was going to do was going to cost him his life. He must have known he was wounded and the ship was sinking and he wasn't leaving. He could have jumped ship and taken his chance in the water with everybody else. He wasn't going to do that and he didn't do that. Why do Hollywood keep making up stories of action and heroism and war and battles and why do they keep writing these qualities, these, these characters that doesn't or never did exist? when the history books are so full of self-sacrificing, full of valor, heroicisms from the wars that have been uh, written down. 
There's more than enough in history to make movies about without having to make it up. And that's why it's important to study history, because you come across some great figures. That's why we need to remember our history. Uh, another question uh, was about uh, World War II American rockets. And one of the few I could find uh, what that was really interesting is the Tiny Tim uh, self-propelled rocket system, which was pretty much made out of uh, oil drilling pipes. Uh, and the ones who designed it didn't uh, have enough of those, so uh, they had to use the used ones. It was about 500 pounds of semi-armor-piercing uh, bomb that was unguided, weighed about 1,200 pounds, and it traveled about 1,000 feet per second. It was fast, it was heavy, and it was designed to punch through bunkers and to blow up Japanese hiding in caves for the expected invasion of uh, Japan. It was to be launched from Corsairs, Hellcats, Avengers, Helldivers. It was said that it sunk one Japanese warship and damaged another, but I cannot find any verification on this. It was used all the way up 1951 during the Korean War, where it was supposedly to have destroyed a uh, road bridge in Korea. Now, if you look at the statements from the pilots that dropped this thing, it was so loud and heavy that when they dropped it, they had no idea if they hit anything. And even in testing, they never really got any feedback. And as it was unguided, they had to come in close and point the plane at whatever they were kind of hoping to hit. Then they would drop the rocket, and it was attached to a lanyard that would eventually come when it was far enough away from the propeller, would uh, set off the ignition and it would just go screaming forwards up the plane. Most of the pilots that were training with this thing for World War II pretty much saw themselves as kamikaze pilots, which is why this came up, because they had to go so low and close that they would be sitting ducks for any kind of anti-aircraft weaponry sitting in the vicinity. It was not further developed also, although a larger version named Richard was developed but never put into production. It was one of the uh, first heavy-duty bunker buster bombs, especially we take the heavy casing that it was made into. And I thought it was an interesting piece of weaponry that you probably haven't heard of because you don't really see a whole lot of them left. And I will leave you with one final picture of the week because I woke up this morning and I thought to myself, armored trains, they are so cool. Why doesn't anybody ask me about armored trains? Because I don't really know anything about armored trains, except I saw one in the Ukraine, along with a T-34 turreted Russian um, motor torpedo boat, which was really cool, and I didn't get to crawl around in it, so now i got to go back there. But armored trains, here you go. They're cool. I like them. If you're going to travel, travel in style. Uh, everybody used them. Uh, World War One, World War Two. There was a lot of armored trains with a lot of cannons because they could lift and carry uh, heavy weaponry because they were on rail. Unfortunately, weren't really very maneuverable. They had to go where the rails were, which was also very predictable for aircraft. And if you someone destroyed the rails, the train wouldn't go anywhere and it would be sort of a sitting duck. Which is why they pile on a whole lot of cannons and weapons and machine guns and they. AA guns on it. Anyway, armored trains. Happy birthday. And on that lovely note, I am going to say goodbye. Send me your questions, militaryhistoryqa at mail.com, lostbattlefields.com. All the photos from the episodes are up there. I'm not sure if there'll be an episode next week because I have to go to Europe and film stuff just for you. And one you know. Just for you. Have a nice day.